partners across government and across the province. Through our skills and learning branch, the department oversees apprenticeship programming, adult and workplace education, and Employment Nova Scotia. Employment Nova Scotia manages skills upgrading that helps Nova Scotians fulfill their employment and earning potential. Employment Nova Scotia also manages our involvement in jobs here, as well as our federal provincial initiatives, the Labour Market Development Agreement, the Labour Market Agreement, and the Target of Initiative for Older Workers. On March 29th, Her Honour, the former Lieutenant Governor, referred to a number of initiatives in the speech from the throne and our department will, that our department will implement in the coming year. These initiatives reinforce the province's plans to make life better for Nova Scotians. This includes living within our means, creating good jobs and growing the economy, and maintaining a high quality, affordable and sustainable post-secondary education system. Now these initiatives include, but are not limited to providing Nova Scotians with the information they need to make informed decisions about the career opportunities that they wish to pursue. Training Nova Scotian workers to use the latest technology and work practices, making us more competitive around the corner and around the world. Continuing Nova Scotia's tradition of stable labor relations building a culture of safety in all workplaces across the province, improving our student assistance program, and keeping tuition for undergraduate Nova Scotians at or below the national average. Our department is a key partner in this government's Jobs Here initiative. Last year, we released two strategies that support Jobs Here, our immigration strategy, Welcome Home to Nova Scotia, and the Nova Scotia Workforce Strategy. Last year, we learned that Irving Shipyards was a successful bidder for the 30-year, $25 billion combat ships contract. This is a game changer that will have a profound and positive effect on Nova Scotia's economy and on life across Nova Scotia. It will improve the lives of Nova Scotians in ways that we can scarcely imagine. For example, approximately 700 electricians, metal fabricators, sheet metal workers, welders, carpenters, steam fitters, and pipe fitters, and millwrights will be needed over the life of the project. All over and above the normal market demand for these trades. Our government is making the necessary investments to have a skilled and experienced workforce ready for these opportunities. The public sector school program will introduce a high school trades level trades training and the Nova Scotia Community College will further tailor its offerings to meet industry demands. Where we do not have enough trained workers here at home to meet the demand, we are attracting the best and the brightest from across Canada and around the world to share in our good fortune. In addition to those factory floor opportunities, our universities will develop the engineers, the business leaders, the visionaries needed to turn contracts and concepts into Canada's next generation naval fleet. Where generations of Nova Scotians used to look west for opportunity, all of Canada and eyes around the world will now turn toward Nova Scotia. As a result of this opportunity, roughly two generations of Nova Scotians will have chances that their fathers and grandfathers lacked. They will have choices. We are putting the resources they need in place that will help them make choices that work for them. For example, we've recently launched a new website called careers.novascotia.ca. 
that brings together resources and websites from across government under one roof, making it easier for Nova Scotians to discover ways to attach to the workforce. It is the place to go to access information about needed skills and the learning and training opportunities available. The Careers Nova Scotia website has information for career development, where the jobs will be, how many people are needed in that sector, etc. Information necessary to make informed decisions that will lead to challenging and rewarding careers. Careers that will provide for a family, for a home, for a prosperous future right here in Nova Scotia. Careers Nova Scotia is part of this government's $200 million investment in jobs here, making sure that Nova Scotians have the skills, the knowledge, and the experience they need to succeed. More than ever before, we're committed to providing training for Nova Scotians. Our workforce strategy addresses the economic challenges and helps Nova Scotians acquire the right skills for good jobs. To that end, we have actively engaged Nova Scotians who need more skills to succeed. We have provided workplace education programs, adult learning opportunities, and funded training for businesses that purchase new equipment or adopt new processes. We have a new workplace initiatives division in the department, and this government is investing up to $1 million in workplace education. Workplace education is a unit of the new division that coordinates programs such as the Workplace Education Initiative, One Journey, Work and Learn, and One Journey at Work. The Workplace Education Initiative is a nationally recognized program that's intended to improve workplace essential skills, mobility, and assist career transition and continuity. Workplace education is a flexible, partnership-based model which encourages government, business, and labor organizations to invest in education and training, cultivating a culture of learning within workplaces. As part of the Productivity Investment Program, funding for a workplace education initiative was increased by $300,000 in 2010-11 and $1 million in 2011-12. We have signed, sorry, we have eight regional workplace education coordinators who develop and deliver workplace education programs, and employers can apply for a grant to hire their own trainers. Workplace education helps companies to be more competitive and provides workers with the skills they need to meet the challenges of the new workplace. It builds capacity in organizations and individuals. The Workplace Education Initiative supports human resource planning and essential skills development in workplaces across the province with educational programs that address uh, specific issues and use materials that are relevant to each workplace. Training takes place at the work site, usually during work hours, Workplace Education Initiative promotes learning at work and supports the development of a skilled, adaptable, and competitive workforce. By February 29th, the Workplace Education Initiative had delivered 195 programs and or organizational needs assessments to 3,261 participants. That's more than twice the number of participants who benefited last year, Mr. Chair. Last year, more than 14,000 Nova Scotians got jobs after receiving coaching and other services through our department. Under our Workplace Education Initiative, we are increasing funding and the number of employers who can provide customized education and essential skills programs to their employees. The Workplace Education Initiative has had a broad take up with companies of all sizes benefiting. There have been large manufacturers like Maritime Paper Products, Peter Kohler Windows and Louisiana Pacific. Medium-sized businesses such as Elmsdale Lumber 
and Allendale Electronics have participated, as have small businesses like Inglis Jewelers. Programming has been sponsored by local regional development authorities and chambers of commerce throughout the province. Workplace education programs provide an affordable partnership model to respond to the changing needs of business to increase productivity and build worker confidence. The province pays for an assessment to determine the needs of the workplace and we provide the instructor with business absorbing the remaining costs. Employers are enthusiastic about workplace education. Canada's favorite green grocer, Pete Luckett, says, quote, workplace education worked with us to develop a training program customized to our staff. Employees who took part in the program are thrilled and can apply the knowledge to their work immediately, end of quote. Dan Clark of Odorware manufacturer Helly Hansen told us, quote, Helly Hansen transitions as Helly Hansen transitions into new markets, developing our ability to adapt to change is crucial. Workplace education gave us the confidence to come to the change table, end of quote. Janet Tom Thomas, Minus Basin Pulp and Power says, quote, People could relate to the material and bring it directly back to work, end of quote. Employees are also receptive to workplace education. Dan Francis from Pete's Fruitique says, quote, it gave me a whole new skill that I could apply to the job, end of quote. Kevin Landry from the Department of Transfer, uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal told us, quote, a decade ago, I was a snowplow driver, and now I've earned my GED diploma, got a new job, and now I help other people reach their goals, end of quote. Kevin is now an equipment instructor and inspector with TIR. A large part of preparing tomorrow's workforce today is making sure that people possess essential workplace skills. This year, the Nova Scotia School of Adult Learning, NASAL for short, is celebrating its 10th anniversary. NASAL continues to offer tuition-free services for adult learners in English and French in more than 140 programs at 68 sites across the province. The services range from basic literacy to high school completion. Over the past 10 years, there have been thousands of enrollments and more than 4,000 graduates, a milestone to be proud of. We want to attract even more Nova Scotians to Nassau by increasing our marketing efforts and by creating a virtual school. The virtual school will make it even easier for Nova Scotians to access the skills and education they need to compete in tomorrow's job market. With our declining workforce and the demand for skilled workers expected to outstrip the supply by 2015, we will continue to further train and upskill workers already in the province. And Mr. Chair, our department has helped other departments deliver on their commitments. Take providing better health care sooner, for example. There has been a shortage of continuing care assistance, CCAs, in Nova Scotia. These dedicated professionals work in nursing homes, hospitals, and private homes, caring for our seniors. Through one journey and jobs here, we have been able to meet the needs of the health care sector. The program is called LINK. Participants are interviewed and trained and then go right to work in the industry. By the end of their training, graduates earn their high school certificate and a Nova Scotia Community College certificate. Last year, we had 156 graduates of the program, all of whom had a job offer waiting for them. The success of these programs reflected in comments we've received from participants and employers. Marcilla Gale of Amherst is a CCA who graduated from the program. Quote, taking the CCA course has been the most rewarding step in my life, she says. It not only improved my communication skills, 
but also my knowledge of what a CCA position is all about, I'd like to thank everyone involved for this opportunity." End of quote. Similarly, Robin Fage, RN, Director of Healthcare Services at Gables Lodge in Amherst says, quote, Gables is proud to have been part of this initiative and the completion of this course will prove to be a huge asset to our facility. This will most definitely help relieve the staffing issues that we are experiencing not only at Gables Lodge, but with CCA positions in long-term care throughout Cumberland County, end of quote. I should mention, Mr. Chair, that the LINK program is provided at no the Nova Scotia Community College at no cost to the student. While preparing Nova Scotians for the opportunities ahead, while preparing for the opportunities ahead remains a priority, there simply are not enough of us to fully meet the demand. And to fill that need, we need more people to move to Nova Scotia. Now that includes Nova Scotian families who moved west for employment in the past, and it includes encouraging other Canadians to move to Nova Scotia. And it includes skilled, innovative, and professional immigrants. Our new immigration strategy, Welcome Home to Nova Scotia, is the most comprehensive and focused plan Nova Scotia has ever had. It complements jobs here and our workforce strategy by identifying international workers with the technical skills and international contacts the province needs to become innovative, productive, and competitive, and keeping them here. In each of the next two year, of the last two years, we attracted 500 provincial nominees as allowed under the quota that Ottawa imposed on Nova Scotia since 2010. In fact, we were allowed to exceed, exceed our quota because other provinces did not meet theirs. Our goal is to increase immigration to more than 7,000 people by 2020 and our retention rate to 70%. Now, we have a number of initiatives and programs rolling out to achieve that goal. For example, Nova Scotia Starts will extend a welcome to immigrants even before they arrive. Prospective immigrants will receive information about employment opportunities and living in Nova Scotia before they move here. This helps prepare them both professionally and personally to make a successful transition to life and work in Nova Scotia. As well, we will continue lobbying the federal government to increase the cap as we have both the need and the capacity. And as well, we will continue to work with private industry to recruit new skilled workers to meet our labor market needs. Now I'd like to take a moment to uh, reflect on some comments my federal counterpart made across the harbor a month or so ago. Now perhaps Minister Finley was not fully briefed when she told Nova Scotians that we didn't need more immigrants, we simply needed to put our unemployed to work. Human Resources and Skills Development Canada, Minister Finley's own department, frequently issues labour market opinions to Nova Scotia businesses. And these are required before Ottawa will allow a Nova Scotian employer to recruit foreign workers even for a temporary assignment. We have been saying for years that Nova Scotia faces a critical shortage of skilled workers. Nova Scotia has an aging population with many baby boomers approaching retirement. We have fewer children entering the public school system, which means fewer people entering the workforce in the future. We have already started to make inroads in our attraction and retention levels. Retention is critical because we need people to stay, not to perceive Nova Scotia simply as a doorway into Canada, a point of entry on a road to a different destination. And I'm pleased, Mr. Chair, to say that 67% of immigrants landing in Nova Scotia make it their home. Our goal is to continue increasing that retention rate to at least 70%. Regardless of whether someone is looking for work in their hometown or traveling around the world to pursue an opportunity. Everyone wants to have a job 
that they can depend on to provide them and their families with steady income. In essence, Mr. Chair, they want a stable labor environment. They want a workplace that is productive, challenging, rewarding, with fair bargaining and dispute resolution processes. And Nova Scotia is fortunate to be su just such an environment. More than 90% of contract negotiations are resolved without a workplace disruption. To improve on that record, our government passed legislation last fall that makes it easier for newly unionized workplaces to reach a first contract. It is a made in Nova Scotia approach that includes an education component not found in other jurisdictions, a timeline that provides more time for employers and unions to negotiate their own collective agreement and a role for the Labour Board. Over the past year, we consolidated six workplace adjudication boards into the new Labour Board I just referenced and appointed a full-time chair, Douglas Ruck, QC. Regardless of whether one is seeking redress under occupational health and safety legislation, collective agreements, or the Labour Standards Code, the new Labour Board provides a more streamlined and consistent structure to do so. Legislation passed last fall introduced a new Pensions Benefits Act, which will see pension plan members better informed about the benefits and financial health of their plan and which provides plan administrators with new options for plan designs. These new options will make it easier for more employers to offer pension plans to their employees. We also passed legislation to ensure that men and women who are new to the country can take time off without pay to attend their citizenship ceremony. And last spring, we passed legislation designed to improve the protection of temporary foreign workers, especially with regard to recruitment and unfair treatment. Mr. Chair, Nova Scotia needs a stable labour environment to prosper, and the, those are but some of the measures that we have put in place to maintain this province's enviable labour relations record. With regard to workplace safety, Mr. Chair, our department and partners such as the Workers' Compensation Board and Safety Services Nova Scotia have been making progress in establishing a safety culture in this province. This year is especially somber as we remember several poignant anniversaries. The 20th anniversary of the West Ray disaster, where 26 coal miners died the 20th anniversary of the McDonald's murders in CBRM, where two employees died and one was paralyzed, and the 30th anniversary of the sinking of the Ocean Ranger. While the Ranger was technically in Newfoundland and Labrador, it is a reminder to those currently working in our offshore energy sector. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador and the Government of Canada continue to negotiate a health and safety regime for the offshore. These negotiations have been going on for too long, and it is time <clears throat> to bring them to a successful conclusion before another life is lost. Regretfully, we had a very disconcerting start to 2012. To date, there have been 10 workplace deaths in Nova Scotia, one just this morning in Dartmouth, which we, we are investigating. We made the unprecedented move of issuing a news release early on this year, asking employers and employees to be more vigilant on the job. And thankfully, the alarming rate of fatalities has slowed. And that is excellent news, Mr. Chair, because we have otherwise been seeing a steady decline, not only in fatalities, but in time loss injuries. Injuries that are serious enough to make a worker unavailable for their next scheduled shift. More good news, 
we are seeing a general trend of employees returning to the workplace faster than before. On April 13th, I tabled the Workers' Compensation Board's 2011 annual report. And I'd like to share some highlights with you and the members. I want to begin by commending the WCB for taking a different approach to their report this year. The, uh, the report showcases the 2011 Mainstay Award recipients. The Mainstays are presented jointly by the WCB and the department to recognize organizations, companies, and individuals who are leaders in promoting a culture of safety. Nominations for the 2012 Mainstays are being accepted until June 29th for this year. And there's a lot of information about the categories and the application process at www.mainstayawards.ca. In 2011, there were 27,786 claims registered with the WCB, down from 28,002 claims in 2010. And since 2005, the number of Nova Scotians who are injured on the job has declined by 27%. The injury rate dropped considerably in the construction sector, the fourth largest industry sector in Nova Scotia. The injury rate, a ratio of time lost claims per 100 workers, continues to decrease. It is now 2.02 lost time claims per 100 workers, down from 2.26 per 100 workers just two years ago. Even with this good news, Mr. Chair, there's room for improvement. Strains and sprains remain the most common type of time loss injury, comprising 62.6% in 2011. Back injuries account for one third of time loss injuries in 2011. Preventing back injuries will be the focus of a new WCB public education initiative, which will be um, unveiled this spring. In the realm of workplace safety, we will continue to raise awareness about the importance of safe, fair, and healthy workplaces. This will come from a mix of educational and enforcement activities that will include stronger penalties for health and safety offenses. Our department has been very forthright regarding administrative penalties, Mr. Chair. We appeared before the Public Accounts Committee on this topic last October. And I did promise to provide details around administrative penalties during estimates for one of the members, and I will honor that commitment now. Administrative penalties came into effect on January 15, 2010, to accomplish three objectives. One, to provide staff from Occupational Health and Safety Division with another tool to encourage compliance to existing laws. Two, to create a deterrent where there is a failure to comply with existing laws. And three, to provide an alternative to other forms of enforcement such as prosecution that can have more significant burden on the courts and the Provincial Prosecution Service. Administrative penalties were implemented to provide an enforcement vehicle could be appropriately applied as an alternative to prosecution, thereby lessening the burden on the court system. Now, to draw a parallel to enforcing our motor vehicle laws, there are offenses that garner a ticket, speeding, for example, and others that result in court proceedings, a collision that results in a death, for example. And, like a speeding ticket, an administrative penalty is imposed after one breaks the law and it is, an, is intended to promote further compliance with the law. Now, a speeding ticket is not rescinded because one drives away at the correct speed limit. By continuing to drive the correct speed limit, you avoid future tickets. As I said, administrative penalties avoid placing too large a burden on our courts. Prosecutions are generally reserved for the most serious of offenses, those that result in a serious injury or death. 
While we were developing the administrative penalty system, we informed stakeholders of the pressures facing the department, including compliance-related statistics in all industrial sectors, and used input from them to finalize the process. Before administrative penalties were introduced in January 2010, the department launched an education and awareness campaign. In addition to the January 15, 2010 news release, the department distributed a pamphlet entitled Workplace Health and Safety. It's a shared responsibility to individuals, unions, employer and industry associations, and to attendees at public meetings, conferences, information sessions, and regulatory inspections across the province. We also created a frequently asked questions page on our website and posted the guidelines that explain how penalties are decided by the administrator. We circulated the links to these pages through our monthly newsletter. In addition, staff made more than 60 presentations across the province. These were well attended and with audiences sometimes exceeding 200 people. Administrative penalties reflect the internal responsibility system. That's the foundation of the Occupational Health and Safety Act and its regulations. And in essence, IRS says that government, employers, and employees all have a role to play in making and keeping workplaces safe. We had heard before the administrative penalties came into effect that employers felt too much of the burden fell to them and not enough to the employees. For example, beforehand, they could have been fined for not providing adequate training and protective equipment, but employees were not fined for failing to follow the employer's safety program. Administrative penalties are starting to address that. Administrative penalties are relatively new to Nova Scotia, having been in effect only two years and a bit. And we continue to monitor their impact on workplace safety and their efficacy, and we will tweak the initiative as need be. A quick overview of the process may be in order. And I have to say, I do get a lot of questions about administrative penalties, and I, I really believe that this uh, detail is both timely and extremely relevant to every member in this house. So when an officer visits a workplace, possibly as the result of an injury or illness, perhaps because of a complaint, or simply as part of a standard inspection, she or he may notice situations that are not in compliance with the act. They issue orders with which the business must comply in a specified amount of time. Some may be stop work orders where an activity is suspended until a condition is met. That condition may be, chain, may be charged, sorry. What is that? May, oh, sorry. That condition may be changes to that activity or requirement for an independent expert to inspect a piece of machinery, for example. And when the business addresses the order and comes into compliance, they must notify the officer of that fact. All those orders come back to the Department of Labor and Advanced Education, where an administrator review each one to determine if an administrative penalty should be issued. So to provide a consistent approach, one administrator reviews all orders that are issued based on established guidelines. We have posted those on our website so that employers and employees know what is expected of them. And those guidelines determine which orders merit an administrative penalty. If the administrator determines that an administrative penalty should be issued, the amount is determined according to the regulation by the recipient's position, their level of authority, and the potential for immediate or an actual injury. So the administrator has the authority to increase or decrease an administrative penalty based on three factors. One, 
the efforts made to prevent a contra contravention from occurring. Two, whether or not the person on whom the administrative penalty is imposed derives any economic benefit from the contravention. And three, the relative harm the contravention causes to any person. As well, penalties can be doubled for a contravention if the person on whom the administrative penalty is imposed has already received one for a previous contravention, or if they've been convicted of an offense under Section 70 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act within the last three years. Initial penalties range from $100 to $1,000. Maximum fines range from $500 to $2,000 unless they are doubled under Section 7 because of a previous uh, penalty or conviction. There is an appeal process if people feel that they have not been issued, should not have been issued an administrative penalty. The, the technical orders are initially appealed to the director and if a further appeal is required, these and administrative penalty appeals go to the Labour Board. Penalties must be paid within 30 days of the Labour Board's decision. In 2011-12, the administrator reviewed 3,306 orders. The year previous, the administrator reviewed 4,221. In 2011-12, those reviews resulted in 780 administrative penalties being issued. The year previous, there were 1,154 administrative penalties issued. So in 2011-12, about one in four orders resulted in an administrative penalty. The dollar value administrative penalties, like their quantity, has declined. The value of administrative penalties issued in 2011-12 was $528,776. In the year previous, the amount was $649,496. Like most fines, the money goes to general revenues rather than being earmarked for a specific cause. General revenues fund most government programming, including safety initiatives. In closing on this issue, Mr. Chair, I will table a copy of the one-year review of administrative penalties tabled by my department last year. Moving from the labor side of the department, I will now spend some time explaining how this department is making post-secondary education affordable for students and their families and for taxpayers. This year, our department is investing $48 million in student assistance. This complements last year's investment of $42.5 million. So over two years, more than $90 million has been invested to protect students from large tuition increases, to reduce the amount of student assistance that graduates must pay back, and to overall reduce student debt. This year's investment includes $5.5 million in new money to further address unmet need and to increase the grant portion as students had requested. We will release further details in the coming weeks. Their student debt will be reduced to a maximum of $28,560, thanks to Nova Scotia's first ever debt cap. Over four years, students will be able to earn up to $13,600 without seeing a reduction in the student assistance they receive. But that is not all. We have taken steps to make our excellent university system affordable for students and for taxpayers. Affordable for students by rolling tuition back and then limiting tuition increases, fee increases must be justified beforehand. Our efforts to make a university education affordable do not end upon graduation. The province administers a graduate retention rebate that reduces the tax bill of recent graduates. In this sense, recent is a relative word because the benefit continues to be available for six consecutive tax years. 
Under the graduate retention rebate, grads can receive a tax credit of up to $15,000 for university graduates and $7,500 for community college graduates over six years. Each year, the province makes assumptions about the size of the graduate pool that is eligible to receive the credit and, it, and about the uh, take-up rate. The pool of graduates is cumulative since they have year, the year of graduation plus the next five tax years to take advantage of the credit. The graduate retention rebate was implemented in 2009 and the province estimated 5,880 graduates could claim the graduate retention rebate and approximately set aside $7.8 million for the rebate. The Canada Revenue Agency has told us that 2,810 tax filers claimed some or all of the credit. The take-up meant a $3.9 million tax savings for recent grads. In the 2010 tax year, the pool of eligible graduates essentially doubles to 11,764 because we would have two years of graduating students. And accordingly, the budget allocation increased to reflect this, setting aside $15.6 million. <coughs> continue. <clears throat> the preliminary count on number of filers claiming the credit in the 2010 tax year as received from CRA is 3,530 and the tax savings for grads totaled $5.3 million. It may be higher because we won't receive CRA's final data for a while. The 2009 and 2010 take up was lower than estimated. So the forecast for 2011-12 was revised, assuming less take up. That estimate will continue to be adjusted as we receive CRA numbers. If uptake increases, so will the allocation. The CRA provides an aggregate number which does not let us determine how many college students are taking up the rebate as opposed to university graduates. Some have suggested that the low take-up means that fewer graduates are staying and earning a living in Nova Scotia, and that is not the case. A significant portion of graduates return to university or community college for additional education. As well, low take-up may mean that income levels immediately after graduation may not be sufficient to access the rebate but the grad may qualify in following years. Also, 2009 would have only included graduates in 2009 whose income levels would have been much lower in year of graduation than in the following years. Mr. Chair, could I ask for just a couple minute break, please? Uh, absolutely, Minister. I was going to, in fact, uh, ask if you need a little time. Uh, we will take a few minutes uh, recess uh, uh, for the minister uh, to uh, look after her coughing uh, spell here.
I recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for losing my voice there. I'm, I'm pleased that I could share this information with the members, uh, Mr. Chair, since the minutes. rebate is offered by the province and benefits thousands of our graduates every year. To date, the graduate retention rebate has saved college and university grads $9.2 million. I'll repeat that. To date, the graduate retention rebate has saved college and university grads $9.2 million. Mr. Chair, our government is also working to make our university system affordable to taxpayers by reducing operating grants to universities and requiring them to address their inflationary pressures without additional funding from the province. If I may, Mr. Chair, I'd like to address some comments about operating grants to universities. In this House, we have heard claims that we are taking $75 million out of, the university, out of university education. To the contrary, we have reduced university funding by 4% last year and 3% this year and invested more than $90 million in our students. One must remember that for every dollar that a student pays for tuition, the province, that is the taxpayers, invest $2 in the university system. And the reductions to university operating grants don't come without additional supports. We have established a three-year, $25 million Innovation and Excellence Fund that will help the sector to identify opportunities to work more efficiently and more strategically while maintaining the excellent learning opportunities they provide to Nova Scotians, to Canadians, and scholars from around the world. Over three years, the universities, either acting individually or as a group, will apply for the, to the fund for seed money to impl implement new ways of doing business, new approaches that will permanently trim at least $25 million from their annual operating costs. The universities have just been informed about the initial projects that have been approved, and we are considering additional projects at this time. Now, moving to the Advisory Council on the status of women, we are raising awareness about important issues such as domestic violence, making Nova Scotia safer for women of all ages. Statistics show that about two women report being a victim of sexual violence every day. And we know that these numbers are underreported. Next week, I have the honour to chair the Federal Provincial Territorial Meetings of Ministers here in Halifax, a gathering of my counterparts from across the country. And that meeting leads into a three-day conference of the Canadian Coalition of Women in Engineering, Science, Trades and Technology, CC West for short, that explores all of the accomplishments and opportunities available to women in those fields. Status of Women is also developing an online guide designed to help immigrant women access information about living in Nova Scotia. Status of Women is also working on initiatives that will improve access to health care and to promote greater equity and diversity. <coughs> Another important initiative our government and my department is creating is jobs and growing is creating jobs and growing the economy. As part of jobs here, the province is finalizing its workforce strategy. This will be a call to action for all stakeholders to increase productivity and innovation and to reinforce the connections between learning and work. It is important that every woman has choices that enable them to be independent and self-sufficient. Working with Encana Corporation, Status of Women will continue the Bread and Roses bursary, providing 20 young women with a $1,000 award to pursue science, trades, and technology programming at the Nova Scotia Community College. 
In a similar vein, Women for Economic Equality, Labour and Advanced Education, and the Hypatia Society will help women pursue science, trades and technology studies at four Nova Scotia Community College campuses. The biannual campaign school will also be held again, inviting more and more women to become active in politics and the political process. This gives them an opportunity to shape the future of their communities, their province, and their nation. In addition to this campaign school, my department is a strong supporter of the five municipal campaign sessions that are being offered across the province this year. Now, as a foundation for our uh, forthcoming parry and thrust uh, questioning around the work of the department, I would like to reaffirm that Labour and Advanced Education's vision, mission and mandate, and I'm going to give some details on that, and I'm also going to be talking about how we are contributing to delivering on government priorities. And I mention this because when I was a critic uh, in the official opposition, um, I really did find it useful to check um, my, uh, the department that I was the critic for, to check their, their website and better understand um, you know, their, the vision and uh, the mission and the, the mandate. And I really found it was uh, a useful way to frame uh, what I felt were meaningful questions. So Labour and Advanced Education's vision is fairness, safety and prosperity for all Nova Scotians by living, learning and working to their highest potential. The department's mission is as follows, to improve the social and economic well-being in Nova Scotians through education, improved working conditions, and services that help them live, work, and learn. To promote equitable and affordable access to quality higher education and knowledge for Nova Scotians in partnership with universities, colleges, federal funders, and service delivery providers to take a lead role in engaging and working with partners to attract, integrate, and retain immigrants, recognizing the important contributions they make to our social, economic, and cultural fabric, and to advance equality, fairness, and dignity for all women in Nova Scotia. Last but not least, our mandate is as follows. The Nova Scotia Department of Labor and Advanced Education works to develop a competitive workforce by making strategic investments in people, programs, services, and partnerships. Our mandate is to provide a fair, equitable, safe, productive, and inclusive environment in which to learn, work, and live. Our broad mandate for the Department of Labor and Advanced Education includes regulatory responsibility for occupational health and safety, building, fire and technical safety, private, municipal and university pensions, workers' advisory progr advisors program, labor relations and labor standards. Improving access among Nova Scotians to labor market information, employment services and learning programs that support their labor market attachment and growth. Strategic action is taken to help all Nova Scotians prepare for, find and keep employment and to meet the needs of Nova Scotia's labour market. Providing opportunities for individuals to advance at home, in the community and in the workplace through adult learning, literacy and essential skills, apprenticeship and skill development programs developing a supportive environment for volunteers and developing nonprofit and voluntary sector capacity. Providing funding, services and support to post-secondary institutions to maintain access to high quality post-secondary education and information. Attracting, integrating and retaining immigrants and bringing to my attention matters related to women to improve the status of women in Nova Scotia. With regard to government priorities, the department is helping to 
helping uh, the province get back to balance through initiatives such as the labour market programs, support system, technology that enables a, a common system and a, a business uh, and business practices to administer programs and services, and streamlined modern legislation. Our better health care sooner priority, as I explained earlier, is supported through initiatives such as the LINK program that trains CCAs. Other examples include prevented, uh, preventive initiatives that promote injury and illness avoidance at home and at work. To create good jobs and to grow the economy, we are helping employers to improve productivity through workplace education and by maintaining a stable labour relations environment. We are reviewing the apprenticeship program, uh, apprenticeship system, and helping people who are unemployed or underrepresented in the workplace to find work and prosper. The performance measures that my government, the members here, and all Nova Scotians will use to measure our success are laid out in the 2012-2013 Statement of Mandate. With regard to workplace health and safety, we want our time lost claims to be at or below the national average. In 2011, Nova Scotia was at 2.02 claims per 100 workers, while the national average was 1.9 claims per 100 workers. As well, we want to see that the average duration of time lost claim to be at or below the national average. So in 2010, Nova Scotia's average was 98 days, and the national average was 69.8 days. To achieve these goals, we will collaborate with the Workers' Compensation Board and other safety partners, conduct targeted risk-based inspections, where the higher the risk of injury, the more often you will be inspected, and other work safety initiatives. On the labour relations front, we want time lost to strikes or lockouts to be at or below the national average. Last year, there were four work stoppages in Nova Scotia. Metro Reg Regional Housing, Summer Street Industries, Maritime Paper, and Metro Transit. And the equivalent of 62 work days were lost. This puts our province in the middle of the pack with respect to average number of work days lost in other jurisdictions across Canada. At the same time, we want to reduce the time that expires between when we receive a Labour Standards Code complaint and when it is assigned to an officer. In 2009-10, we were averaging 16.2 days to accomplish this. And our goal is to do this within 14 calendar days. In 2011-12, we were assigning officers on 9.3 days on average. To see more Nova Scotians attaining their maximum employment potential, we want to see a higher number of people completing their trade certifications. Our target for 2012-13 is 898 certifications. Last year, 813 people completed their certifications. To improve workplace productivity across the province, we intend to issue at least 182 grants to business for programs such as Workplace Innovation and Productivity Skills Incentive. Last year, the first year for which we have uh, done... Order, order. The minister's uh, one hour is, is now up. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Minister, thank you very much for your comments. Um, and uh, thank you for always treating the, the subject matter of your department with, uh, with a, a very real uh, sincerity and, and respect in this house. I always appreciate that. Um, it's obvious that you care very much about the, about the different uh, um, sectors in, that, that your large department covers. And I think you've displayed uh, some, some, very, some very real and helpful competencies in managing um, your portfolio. So congratulations on that. That doesn't mean I'm happy with everything, okay? So let's just be, <laughs> let's just be clear. Um, I, 
uh, we don't we don't have very much time until estimates uh, finish up. So I'm going to start start with uh, some questions around post secondary education. That's a subject that's pretty uh, pretty near and dear to my heart. And then um, and then maybe if we have time, we can move move to some other stuff. Hopefully, uh, that's more in tune with uh, the labor aspects of your portfolio. Uh, I think it's important to give credit where credit is due, and uh, this department has uh, has has uh, brought in some, some positive measures when it comes to addressing the issue of uh, post-graduate uh, support for students. Um, the student debt cap uh, being one of them, I think you know, it's, it's, it's important and helpful to recognize that Nova Scotia had the, uh, I think some of the highest debts in the province, in the country, and to have a debt put on that, I think is a, is a, is a positive step. And that's something that I know former student leaders uh, used to advocate for back in the days when Dennis Cochran was the uh, the DM in the uh, in the um, in the department. Um, anyway, there there still is uh, questions around uh, tuition, though. Uh, I know I still hear from from student groups and parents in my home constituency and other parts of the province who are worried about the increasing cost of tuition. I know that there is an MOU in place for another year. I think for the duration of this fiscal year that will keep tuition increases at no less than 3%, I believe, for Nova Scotian students. Um, the cost will be higher for other province students, I believe, and students coming from, from out of country. Um, but there, is, there, has, there are some concerns after that one year MOU is complete uh, that tuition may go up. Uh, there has been an issue with <laughs> Excuse me, core funding being cut from the education system. Uh, you referenced in your comments about $75 million. So because of that, there probably will be additional pressures put on institutions to cover their costs. Uh, and there's only two ways that institutions get funding from, from the province and, uh, and from, from students. So what are you anticipating tuition levels uh, to be at after the MOU is complete and that three percentage uh, uh, cap is no longer no longer uh, valid. I recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Thank you. Um, I certainly understand and appreciate the uh, the concerns that the honourable member has around um, tuition and the sustainability of of our university system. Um, I know that he's been a, a strong advocate for. Uh, um, for students in the past and um, he of all people probably in this house would would best appreciate the the delicate balance that a government has to to maintain um, we are very fortunate to have a, 11 universities um, in our, our province but it is um, it's a costly system to maintain and uh, certainly between 1999 and 2009, over that 10-year period, the provincial government um, actually increased its funding to universities by 77%. So that, that is a, a trend, a pattern that, uh, that during a recession, um, considering a small um, province that we are, uh, with our limited tax base, that that's a an impossible uh, situation to, to maintain and sustain into the future. So here we are uh, trying to protect all our institutions, knowing that in their various regions that they are the, the economic engines for, for, the econ well, for the economy, but also for, for the cultural and social activities. And, um, and they're very much prized um, by, those, by, by those communities. So aside from the value that they add to, uh, to Nova Scotia in terms of being institutions of, of education and learning and research, um, you know, the, the economic uh, impacts that they have in their regions are very, very important. So government is trying to, to maintain um, those institutions in their communities in a way that both recognizes their, their strengths, builds on those, those assets, but recognizing that every um, service delivery operation in this province has, has to operate 
differently and more uh, efficiently into the future in order to protect that infrastructure across the province. At the same time, our government has maintained that um, we, we feel very strongly that student Nova Scotians should be able to afford to go to both community college and, um, and university. And so we, we have committed, both the Premier and myself in this chamber have said that we are trying to protect as much as possible the ability to, uh, to keep tuition for Nova Scotia undergraduates at Nova Scotia universities at or below the national average in terms of, of tuition. And you know, you've, you've clearly identified that universities have limited um, numbers of, um, of revenue sources. And um, certainly through the memorandum of understanding, the, uh, the presidents have committed to, to reviewing all those uh, various factors that uh, determine the, uh, the ability of, um, viability, I should say, of, of their institutions. Um, the reason that the, it, it makes sense to, in, in a year or two, to actually review tuition is because, as you can imagine, when tuitions were frozen and then, then capped, universities were at different points in their cycles. So some were quite high in, in terms of programming, to, uh, tuition for their programs compared to other universities uh, in the province. Some, some were perhaps uh, uh, you know, at the low point. And so perhaps there needs to be some reset there. Even within an institution, um, you know, we're hearing reports that some, uh, some programs um, <coughs> you know, are, are, have very low tuitions compared to, to others offered in the same university. So I think the, all the presidents are saying is that they just want to look at those situations. And, um, you know, whether there's any adjustment, we have been quite clear that, uh, that we want to maintain for Nova Scotian students, uh, attending Nova Scotian universities, taking undergraduate degrees, that we stay uh, at or below the national average. And as you well recognize, there's other uncertainty as well because that average changes depending on what other jurisdictions are doing. So we're keeping a close eye on, um, on the review and, uh, and reform that's happening across Canada. And um, we will certainly uh, factor that into our analysis and, uh, and review of uh, tuition in this province. But we are, we are committed as a government to protecting our university uh, system across uh, this province and, um, and protecting the, the affordability for, for Nova Scotians to attend. And uh, those will be two of the driving uh, factors during the, the upcoming discussions, analysis and, and uh, recommendations and then, then decision making. But we're in the very early stages of all of that. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, just to, before I ask my next question, I just want to make a, make a quick point. Um, I appreciate that we're doing our best to keep uh, Nova Scotian tuition for Nova Scotian students attending post-secondary education uh, institutions in Nova Scotia at or below the, the national average. But if we want to be uh, the university capital of, of the country, which we, you know, we, we've talked about before. And really pull in the uh, all the the real benefits of having such a vibrant um, uh, post-secondary sector. You know, I think I think an, uh, one thing to 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 consider is to look at tuition costs for out of province students because we have a real opportunity to recruit bright and uh, skilled people from other parts of the country to come and train here and hopefully afterwards stay and join our workforce and maybe build. Families here and become uh, become uh, become Nova Scotians and contribute to the economy here. So that's just another thing I would hope the minister would uh, would consider is is uh, is that. Um, so in terms of in terms of where we at with uh, with the tuition question, from what I understand, the the MOU is is non-existent after this this fiscal year. It's is it complete after this fiscal year or is it next year? There's three more years, but the tuition the tuition level in the MOU is only three percent for this this fiscal year, right? Tuition is only capped at three percent for this year. 
So what um, the question? I, I guess what we what we want to know is. Um, is there an expectation from your department that tuition will go up more than 3% the year following that cap is completed? I recognize the Minister of Labor and Workforce Development. I have no idea what's going to come out of the, the discussion in two years' time on uh, um, you know, whether there needs to be any change in, in tuition, but I'm, I'm telling you uh, and we've been very clear about protecting um, the cap. The cap for, is for th the three years of the tuition. So the discussion will happen, but it won't. Any changes won't take effect until after this MOU is finished. I just want to remind the honourable member as well that um, tuition is the same for Oda Province students as it is for in-province students. Um, there, um, except for the professional programs and, and international students. So if, uh, for example, if you're from New Brunswick, you come in and take uh, uh, an education program at Mount St. Vincent, you don't pay more than a Nova Scotia student does taking in that program. Um, so it's just been clarified that the 3% cap on tuition is in place for the life of this MOU, but that the discussions and analysis and research um, for future considerations will, will happen uh, during the life of that, uh, that memorandum. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, okay, th thank you, Minister. Um, <clears throat> I realize it's uh, perhaps too early to speculate what tuition levels will be, um, but one thing that is, that is happening now is uh, ancillary fees are also going up on, on campuses. I remember when I was at St. Mary's, I don't think it was that long ago, but uh, we had deferred maintenance fees coming in, uh, athletic fees, a lot of other different fees that um, that aren't linked directly to tuition costs, but are but are being put on on students. Uh, and when universities lose funding, and I mean universities have lost about 75 million dollars in core funding over the course of the last two years as a result of of this government's uh, education cuts. Um, universities will go to those ancillary fees to, to increase their revenues in, in very specific and particular areas. What mechanisms are in place in your department to ensure that um, ancillary fees are, are, are regulated and fair and that the real cost of educating, not just tuition, is staying at a competitive level and one that's fair for students and their parents? I recognize the minister for labor and workforce development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly, universities um, need to be able to reflect increased costs. So, for example, um, you know, residence accommodations, just as apartments outside off campus, those rents are going up. Um, certainly they would, uh, they'd want to, they want to get, they want to be able to pay their, their expenses on some of those fees. So under the MOU, um, we've, uh, we've asked them to, uh, to present to me their, what, what they're going to be doing for any fee increases. And, um, and that they will have to both uh, consult with the people impacted, the students, and, um, and they'll also have to have a, a rationale to explain exactly why any fee increases are being, um, are being considered. Um, but they are, the, the university presidents are very aware that, um, you know, Fees, auxiliary and ancillary fees, are not to be seen as a way to to, to recoup, um, you know, revenue that they feel that they're um, they've lost because of inflationary pressures, uh, or because of um, reductions in the provincial um, operating grants, and um, it's a very a very delicate balance for them. But uh, they certainly um, appreciate that that's a very sensitive issue for for students. And um, I have full confidence that they will um, be very cautious in terms of, um, of their increases. I have not seen 
uh, they have not presented me with uh, with the list of expected um, increases, so um, I can't speak from knowledge on on any of that. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it, it just is important to uh, to recognize that when we're talking about educational costs, it, it isn't just tuition. Uh, that these do, these ancillary fees and, of course, the cost of living living have a big uh, big role to play. Um, and so, uh, are we? Is the department does the department track all auxiliary and ancillary fees that are that are brought into place? And and uh, are they taking that into consideration when when we're looking at uh, the full cost of education? Or, or does the department simply look at tuition? Recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've just been reminded that at the most recent meeting uh, with the presidents, they were uh, they were reminded that they um, have to um, um, have to present and their incre any increases in uh, auxiliary and ancillary fees to uh, to me and and the department um, with um, with an explanation of the consultation that they have done with a full um, uh, rationale for why the increase is necessary. And uh, that will be reviewed uh, by my officials and, uh, and myself to ensure that, uh, um, that they're not making money off of, of any of those services, nor, uh, nor the students, that it's not, as I said earlier, it's not a way to recoup uh, any other lost uh, revenue. So they are in, they are in uh, um, process, they are starting to put that package together, but it has not been uh, presented to me yet. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Minister. Uh, back to back to the issue around tuition. Uh, the minister said that uh, for out-of-province students coming here, the the cost, the tuition cost, was the same. Uh, I'm just curious because I know that the, the the minister said that uh, uh, tuition for Nova Scotian students attending here in the province is is at or below the national average. But overall, tuition for undergrads in, in Nova Scotia is, is above the national average. And I think there's only two provinces that have higher tuition than us in terms of undergraduate uh, education. So if, if out-of-province students are paying the same as in-province students and in-province students' tuition are at, levels are at or below the national average, why, why are our tuition levels, according to StatsCan, above the national average? I think they're above by about $300 or so. Recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, the information we get from Stats Canada isn't a nice, tidy package um, because they, they don't separate out uh, necessarily in the information we get. We have to f go further down into the weeds to, find, to separate out, out of province and in province students. Uh, and, and graduate and students who are in graduate programs, so um, we we have to do further analysis to uh, to get that average. So if you just take what comes from Stats Canada, um, that's not the information that we're working with because they include other students in there, students who are in graduate programs. Um, I also just want to uh, to remind the honourable member that Nova Scotia is actually the first government. To, uh, to extend its uh, provincial bursary to Oda student, or sorry, Oda province students at university. Um, I've, it, it's not as much as, as the bursary that uh, we give our own students from Nova Scotia, but we, are, uh, we were the first province to extend um, some benefit to Oda province students in terms of, uh, of bursary as well. So we feel for a small province uh, supporting 11 uh, University uh, universities, and uh, considering the uh, the economic times and, and the restraint we're under, that we are being quite quite fair uh, to Oda Province students, and also, um, you know, we're trying to attract them because as uh, as our youth numbers uh, decline, we certainly want more and more uh, students to come. 
they, uh, you know, they're, the money they spend in this province uh, is, is important to our economy, and as well, it's a way to, uh, to get them integrated into, uh, you know, our families and our communities and our, our cultural and, and uh, economic, um, um, you know, jobs and whatever, and, and they're more likely to stay. And, um, and live and raise their families here in Nova Scotia. So it's a win-win, um, but we have to take a balanced approach because of the, uh, the challenging times we're in. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. <coughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, the challenge remains that when it comes to recruiting uh, out-of-province students that there are only two provinces that have higher tuition levels in their, in their undergrad than Nova Scotia. And that's even worse when we look at, uh, when we look at, according to StatsCan, and when we look at um, graduate tuition levels, we are the, we're the highest, I think, by a pretty substantial amount. Um, you know, universities really becoming the, uh, the new high school in terms of need for um, skills and training to, to gain meaningful employment in the workforce. Um, and more and more, we're seeing that graduate studies are are, are important in terms to and in, in, uh, important for individuals in order to have the skills they need to, to work. What work is the department doing to address the issue of the extremely high uh, tuition costs for for graduate students in the province of Nova Scotia? Because we're at we're we're higher than everybody else. We're higher than every other jurisdiction. We have the highest. So, what are we doing to address that issue? Recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to correct something the Honourable Member said about uh, only two jurisdictions um, having higher tuition. I mean, obviously, for Nova Scotia to be at or below the average uh, means that, that there are more jurisdictions with, with higher, uh, higher tuition for undergraduate uh, um, when we, we pull out and measure under undergrad, uh, sorry, Nova Scotians and undergraduate programs in Nova Scotian universities. Um, regarding uh, the cost of uh, graduate uh, tuition, graduate programs in, in Nova Scotia, um, I can't say that I have a lot of uh, personal knowledge or experience on this, but certainly in my discussions with, um, with various um, university uh, presidents and um, um, vice presidents of finance uh, across the province, um, they they say it's very competitive across uh, across Canada, and uh, they they are able to market their programs and attract um, a number of Oda Province and international uh, students because of the the quality of the graduate programs that they're able to uh, to offer. And um, I have, if I may be allowed a, a little reminiscence here, um, I remember about 15 years ago, friends of mine in, in um, Calgary um, checked, they and their daughter checked universities right across Canada and they ended up uh, sending her to Acadia even though I think at the time it had the highest uh, tuition in, in Canada because of the, uh, I think it was called the Advantage um, program where they had, uh, yeah, they had laptops. It was in the early days of using that as an integral uh, technology within the classroom. And um, you know they were willing to pay the, the, that tuition fee because of the quality of the program. It was innovative. It was very competitive, and they felt that that would give an advantage to um, uh, to their daughter when she went out seeking work. So there are other things that graduate students are work, are looking at uh, to balance the the cost of uh, of tuition, and that's one reason we are really trying to protect the quality of our programming at all levels um, of uh, university because we want to maintain that, that reputation. Certainly a number of our Nova Scotian universities um, market um, their, their programs, their product, if you will, right ar around the world. And uh, I think one of the reasons we're getting such uh, huge increases in our international student numbers is because there's an international reputation to Nova Scotian uh, 
universities, including their graduate programs. So um, that has never been identified as, as a concern by the universities. They're proud of what they do. Uh, they know that they have wonderful, excellent programming, and it's just a matter of getting that information right out to the world, and, uh, and the students will come. So they are very, they pay attention to what each other does in terms of tuition right across Canada, and uh, they're certainly not going to uh, price themselves out of the market. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, listen, we, ha we have world, uh, world class institutions here. I was privileged enough to be a graduate from one at St. Mary's here in Halifax. It's not Roby Street High, so anybody who wants to say that. Great football team, too. Um, and I, I know that, that the institutions themselves do a very uh, excellent job at uh, out-of-province recruitment for graduate programs and out-of-country recruitment as well. Uh, in my experience, a lot of the uh, out-of-province folks, international students that come in, um, are willing to pay the extra costs to, to come study Nova Scotia. And I think that's great. It speaks to the, uh, you know, the, the excellence of our institutions. But there's still the issue of, of affordability of a graduate degree, uh, which is becoming more and more in demand in Nova Scotia. Um, and based on my experience, you know, a lot of the, the folks that are engaged in, uh, in the graduate studies, a lot that come from a province, a lot of them come from, from the higher, higher income levels, uh, fa family income levels. And what I think we need to do is have our, our graduate studies program be affordable for for all students, you know, no matter what their financial means are. I think that needs to be a goal in our province. And the fact is, is that we have the highest graduate um, tuition costs in the country by, by, by a large margin. And I think that we need to do a better job of, I, first of all, identifying um, the necessity around graduate uh, education. You know, it's becoming more and more needed. We want to have an innovative and creative workforce. We need to have, um, young people that are able to pursue postgraduate studies. Um, but I think we really do need to take a look at the high costs of pursuing a graduate study here in Nova Scotia and start to address that. Because we don't want um, our young people not going, or anybody not going, because of because it's not affordable. Um, back to the, the question around, uh, around the MOU and the partnership that's involved in reviewing the tuition policy. Um, one of the concerns that's been brought forward by student groups, uh, I know both uh, both both uh, official student groups that represent uh, post-secondary students here in the province, uh, ANSA, the Alliance of Nova Scotia Student Associations, and the Canadian Federation of Students, Nova Scotia, is that there is there will be no student representation on that on that group that will be reviewing the tuition policy policy. And so my question to the minister is, why after students were involved for so long? Um, well, I guess not that long, but a number of years under the previous government and then this government in the MOU discussions, why have students been excluded from the discussions around tuition? Uh, I see that as problematic because they represent the demographic that is most impacted by, by tuition increases, um, and they represent their families and their parents at those meetings. So my question is, why, why were students uh, excluded from, from that, uh, that partnership that will be reviewing uh, the tuition policy? recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the student representatives from the student organizations um, have, have met with uh, both the Deputy and the Premier and myself on a regular basis, and they have raised this issue. And it's certainly been explained to them that they are not excluded from the process. In fact, it's built into the Memorandum of Understanding that there will be regular consultations with, with students. Um, as we get into the, um, um, you know, the, the more specialized uh, work groups um, under the, the MOU, um, it, it, it made sense to, uh, to have, um, you know, the relevant vice presidents uh, involved in, in, um, on some of those, uh, those work groups. Um, certainly, I would say that student organizations probably have more input 
and more meetings with government over the past three years than they've ever had in the course of their history. And uh, not only do they have the, the physical meetings, but we take what they, uh, their advice and their input very, very seriously. And uh, it's often used to, um, uh, to adjust you know, the, our, the, the outcome of uh, our decision making. So uh, we certainly value um, their input and, um, and always agree to meet. If we don't initiate it ourselves, we agree to, to meet. So there are regular meetings, all levels of government. They will have uh, numerous opportunities to have input on, uh, on these issues. And, um, you know, I, I would say that I have a very good working relationship with the uh, um, the executive members um, and, and executive directors of both those organizations and um, they're, um, you know, I think it's, we've got some very good individuals uh, on those executives. They, uh, they take their, um, these issues very, very seriously. I'm amazed at the extent of the, the, the research and analysis that they do and uh, we have some very productive uh, discussions and they are influencing um, what, what is happening um, through government and uh, affecting all universities. So, um, you know, I make no apologies for the, uh, the extent of the consultation that uh, is currently underway with the student organizations. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased. Um, you know, they, uh, as I said, they have taken it very, very seriously. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, there, um, there are some questions around what, what consultation means, even in terms of the language used in the MOU, um, around, um, you know, auxiliary and ancillary fees. Uh, you said it stated that they need to consult with student groups. Um, it's not clear what that means, if it just means having a meeting with a student union president or an executive director, or if it means that there needs to be a plebiscite on campus or a vote on campus um, to, uh, to actually you know, make, make sure that happens because, you know what, uh, student groups have, have been consulted a lot. I remember when I was a student leader, we had excellent access to the previous government and to members of all parties. I remember some good meetings we had with the, the now Minister of Transportation and um, folks in, in all three different, all three parties. <laughs> but, um, you know what, I think it's important to define what that consultation means and to ensure that it's done in a way that's meaningful and gives, uh, a, a real voice to, to to students who represent their families and parents, um, because I know I, I've been consulted on things before and given my opinion, and my opinion and suggestions were never included in a final document. You know that's, that can be the case with this. A, a, a university can go talk to their student president and say, "What do you think of ancillary fees going up?" And the student president will say, well, "We don't want it to." It tends to be the case that they're going up anyway. So I think we it needs to be a meaningful cons cons consultation process whereby the opinions expressed by, by student leaders who represent a lot of people and a lot of voters in the province are, are taken seriously in, in a very real way and in a tangible way. And specifically with this tuition review policy partnership, um, the student voice has been removed from that committee officially. Um, I realize that the minister does have a great working relationship with, uh, with student groups in the province. I don't doubt that. Um, we have some very, uh, very, as she said, responsible and, and educated and, and bright student leaders. But the fact is, is that you know, having a meeting with, with you is, is one thing. Being on the official body and having a voice represented there that is choosing uh, where the province is going to go with tuition is, is, is completely a, a different thing entirely. And they have been excluded in a very official way from, from that process. Um, and uh, I think it's important to recognize that and to define what, what consultation means and how the student voice will impact um, the outcomes of decisions. I think, I think students need to know what that process is gonna look like and their parents and families who they represent need to know as well. Uh, on, on the issue of affordability, I, I do have another question here. And this is an issue actually that uh, ANSA has brought up. Um, currently there are 2,275 students in Nova Scotia whose annual recognized need outweighs the maximum amount of available assistance. And that's at about an average of uh, $2,043. 
So what is the government doing to address the issue of, of unmet need, un, unmet need um, with our students in the, uh, in the student loan program? Recognize the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to go back to your earlier issue. Um, I just want to remind the honourable member that the uh, the university presidents who are either oh, and, and senior officials who are on these working groups or on this uh, the the working what's it called the partnership uh, group, they they are not making decisions at those levels. They are doing the jurisdictional uh, scans, the um, um, you know the research and analysis, and making making recommendations to government to my my department. So um, I I just want to reinforce that having a good working relationship with people in my department with government is going to serve the representatives of the student organizations very well, and in fact it will um, ensure you know, meaningful consultation and, and probably much more input and influence than perhaps putting, uh, you know, some sort of superficial m membership or, or, or whatever um, in place. So it's it's a combination of things. I They have, have as you say, been very responsible in their work to date and uh, all the more reason why government is going to continue to keep them uh, both informed and also uh, in a situation where they can provide advice and, and input. So I just want to reassure you that uh, we take uh, the information from this, the students' organizations extremely seriously. And, um, you know, I think it's a credit to, to the individuals, as I said earlier, who've been uh, both as staff and, um, and on their executives over the years, that they, they have this, this credibility with uh, with government and we we recognize their stake in all of this um but they're they're um and and they want to make sure that the universities are as sustainable um and uh, as possible so that that relationship the uh, the give and take of the discussion and their ability to uh, to influence um is very very high and um, i just wanted to to reinforce that in regards, you are right, um, in various meetings over the past few years, the issue of unmet need uh, is always raised by ANSA and um, CFS. Um, and we, we appreciate um, their, their focus on that because it's, those are often the most um, uh, vulnerable uh, young people who you know, have the ability to go to university and uh, perhaps just have greater financial need. And that's one reason why this year um, it was very, very difficult. Um, but we were able to uh, to set aside 5.5 million in the budget to um, to continue us down that road to uh, to mitigate um, on that need. Um, so we're we're very pleased, uh, and I'm going to be able to make some announcements um, hopefully in the next several weeks, giving the details of that. But certainly, you know, we, we obviously will be looking at increasing the grant amount and um, um, or the, the grant portion. Uh, but the actual details will have to, to wait for a further announcement. But, you know, I want to give full credit to those two organizations for, uh, for um, you know, maintaining the, the spotlight on that very important issue of unmet need. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Um, so there, there's, I, I still have a question before I, there's a couple more things I want to talk about, but my question is, you know, if the, if the student uh, representatives, if their voice is so important, why were they excluded from that, that tuition review policy committee? Um, you know, just why, why aren't they there? You know, if, if, the, if the minister and the department are taking their concerns so seriously, why not include them on that, on that group? Um, especially considering they were involved in previous previous MOU um, discussions in uh, in recent years, um, and so I guess I'll just ask that question, then we can move on to a couple more things. Yeah, I recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I don't have all the details, but students will be involved on some of the working groups, but I'm not in a position today to say, to say which ones. I just want to remind uh, the honourable member, and I think he would appreciate this. This, this is a period of um, extremely, you, extremely um, unusual times in that I'm sure you remember from your days with uh, student organizations, universities um, have built up traditions of being, you know, autonomous, independent, um, somewhat self-sufficient um, organizations. And the student groups have always said to us that if there's anything you can do to open up the transparency uh, and the accountability of that. So we're, we're in a very delicate new stage of relationship with, uh, with universities. Um, they are starting to, you know, release information and talk to one another in ways that hasn't happened before. And um, so we have to be just very both cautious and sensitive to their need to, you know, protect their competitive edge in terms of some of their financial and other information at the same time that we're trying to encourage them to see where their common ground is and where they need to, to work more uh, collectively together on, uh, on some of the challenges and issues that they, they all face. So um, these are, are very, uh, this is, as I said, a time of transformation. Things are evolving and changing week by week. And, um, you know, as I said, we, we value input from students and we will ensure that every, pos every opportunity possible where they can be actually sitting at the table uh, will be made. But it's not the kind of thing and we have to, you know, develop the trust. We have to make sure that um, the universities are going to be, you know, open and frank. And so we're trying to balance all that and get everybody moving uh, forward. So, um, you know, perhaps there's a little bit of code there, but I think you appreciate what I'm, I'm saying. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair and, uh, and Madam Minister. Uh, uh, running, I guess we only have about 20 minutes left uh, for our first round here, and I don't know how much time we'll have after, but there's two programs that I'd like to talk about specifically. One, the, uh, the graduate retention program. It's one that you mentioned quite a bit in your, uh, in your opening remarks. What is the, the current um, uptake of that program? And percentage-wise, you know, out of all the uh, graduates that are eligible for it in the province, What's the percentage percentage of graduates that are actually uh, using that and staying staying in the province? Recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Okay, I'm going to fill in a little time here while we find the, the relevant parts of, of my speech. Um, you have to recognize that the graduate retention rebate is um, a tax rebate that, that's run out of the Department of, of Finance, so it's not something that, uh, that I work with on a regular basis. Um, but because of its relationship, you know, obviously it was going to be um, a topic raised here today. Okay, so our, the, the information um, that we have on uh, on the tax filers came, uh, is coming from the Canada Revenue Agency. So they are telling us that, uh, just a minute now. That 2,810 tax filers claim some or all of the credit. and that in the 2010 tax year, the pool of eligible graduates essentially doubles to 11,764 because then we have two years of, of graduating uh, students. So um, I believe that's the last um, um, information that we have from, uh, from CRA. Um, and, and I mentioned in my opening remarks some of the reasons why there may be an initial delay 
in people taking advantage of it, but it's still available because it's over, I, I believe it's a six year period. And um, certainly there, um, we, we are doing um, across government, we, we are doing our best to, to make sure that graduating students um, are reminded of, uh, of that opportunity and uh, we'll be putting additional efforts into and resources into getting that, uh, that information out to everyone. Thank you. Recognize the member for Yarmouth. Thank you, and thank you for uh, <clears throat> uh, sharing that uh, sharing that information with us. So, 2,810 people um, use that graduate rebate, and if we, if it's possible at a, at a later date, if we could get the information on what percentage of graduates that is in the province, would we would we be able to do that at, at another date? Maybe provide us with some information from that from the department, just just, just to clarify, because that's that's a. Uh, you know, I've, 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 I've tended to be pretty critical about, about uh, post-grad grad rebates. Um, the uptake tends to not be as high as we'd like it to be, and I think that was reflected in the fact that I believe the department just um, shifted the budget. It looks like a cut to the graduate retention, but I think it's just, it, I think what it is is just to ref more reflect the uptake. I might be, I might be on it. It looks like a cut when you look at it from a budget perspective, but really I think what the department did is just shrink the budget line because the uptake wasn't exceeding the original budgeted amount. Um, so I think that's a, the fact that you had to shrink the budget line for, for this, this program in particular, I think is an indication that the, the uptake might not be where we want it to be. And also in terms of addressing, I, I know key priorities that the minister has said that her department has, uh, affordability and accessibility. I don't think a program like this helps you do that, to be honest, providing the support on the back end. It usually goes to folks that are going through the education system anyway. Uh, I don't know how many people are actually staying in the province because of it. It's hard to track. Um, and the fact is you have to be making money when you graduate anyway to, to benefit from it. And unfortunately, I think a lot of our graduates are in a position when they, when they finish their, their schooling um, where they might not be working right away and they might not be, be eligible for even for, the, for these benefits. So I think this would be one program that would be worth a review to see if you're getting what you want out of it and to see if it actually is contributing to the stated goals of affordability and accessibility uh, and, and, keeping, and, keeping, uh, and keeping people in the province. Just a suggestion, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't, I've never been a huge fan of, 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 of this program and I think the fact that we've had to shrink the budget line to uh, is an indication that the uptake might not be what it is and we might not be getting what we, what we need out of it. I think when you take the limited resources that we have as a province and put them in upfront uh, supports, I think the evidence would indicate that they would be a lot more effective in terms of helping out with affordability and accessibility, getting people into school uh, and helping them complete their program. Uh, and let's talk about the debt cap for a second. Um, as I mentioned before, I think it's a good thing that we've acknowledged the high levels of debt in the province and have capped that. Um, and that's just for undergraduate students, I believe, the, the debt cap. So perhaps we want to look at what the debt levels are for, for graduate students as well and start thinking about what we want to do to keep their debt levels down. But the debt cap in particular, I know uh, ANSA has, has been pushing an idea where you would eliminate the debt cap. Uh, you would eliminate the debt cap, take that money, and put it into uh, upfront grants. And according to the numbers I've looked at, I'm sorry, Minister, but I don't have them in front of me right now. Uh, according to ANSA, they actually said if you do that, you will actually keep debt levels at the same and it will save the department money. And providing that support upfront for students when they're coming into to, to post-secondary um, post education, I think will be a, a lot more beneficial in terms of getting more people into the system and, and helping them. So I think, ANSA's proposal of eliminating the debt cap and taking that money and putting it into upfront grants, which will, in effect, minimize debt, limit debt, and uh, actually, I think, according to their numbers that they they have, it will actually save the province save the province a bit of money. Specifically, with that 5.5, we're just running out of time here, so I just want to make sure I get my questions in. That 5.5 in new money that's going into financial aid that we, we don't have all the details on yet. Did. We have 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. We have some time, we have a bit of time then. Um, that $5.5 million, is that coming from the money that was saved by shrinking the, uh, the, uh, the graduate rebate? 
Is that where that money comes from? Recognize the Minister of Labor and Advanced Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that that is additional new money in the budget. It's not a reallocation from any other budget. And, um, and you know, as I said, we've met with the student organizations um, to get in, um, advice on how we can best use that 5.5 million to, um, um, to reduce the, uh, the unmet need. And um, just in reference to uh, one of your earlier issues about uh, graduate programs, just want to mention that our funding formula um, for the, the grants to universities uh, means that the graduate programs receive three to seven times more money than, uh, than the uh, operating grant for the undergraduate program. So certainly uh, Nova Scotian taxpayers are investing uh, considerable uh, support into, uh, into graduate programs. But, um, and I, I just want to mention on the graduate tax rebate, that is more of um, a, a graduate retention, worker retention, uh, initiative than, um, uh, than meant to, to make university more affordable. And I've, I've said a number of times um, before that as a government, we have to be looking at the menu of supports uh, for both uh, students and graduates and, and workers in this province. And, um, you know, we have to balance uh, what we have available. So by providing the graduate uh, tax rebate, um, you know, we still have to do things to, as you say, to make uh, university affordable and accessible to students, but they're, they're not in competition with one another. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we are trying to make strategic investments in all the different areas. Thank you. I recognize the member for Yarmouth. Um, I just, I just think, it, I think it is worthwhile to, to, to do a review of that program to see if we're getting our bang for our buck out of it. Um, I know, I forget when that, when that came in, but I remember it, it has been pitched as, you know, we'll, we'll make your education more affordable by giving you money back um, after you graduate if you stay here. And I, I just don't know if we're being successful at actually keeping grads here. I don't know if there's ever been a study done. So I just think it's worth, it's worth the department's uh, resources to take a look at it uh, and see if having funds through this graduate retention program is actually meeting the, its, intended, its intended goals. Uh, and that's, that's just, that, uh, it's mostly just a personal opinion <laughs> on, on graduate uh, retention rebates. I don't think they work as well as we, we pretend they do. Um, I, uh, I, I guess just before we, we leave this, this subject, um, I just again want to emphasize that I believe cutting the, the $75 million out of the core funding for, for institutions is going to create um, affordability troubles for students and their families. I know that the department has allocated some resources into having back-end supports in place to cap debt and, uh, and uh, of course, to give a, give a rebate when you, when you graduate if you're going to stay here. But when you take money out of our institutions, it's going to affect, affect, uh, affect them in, in a few very real ways. One, costs are going to go up to students and their parents and families who help contribute to their, uh, their education. Um, it's going to put a, a, a extreme pressures on institutions to, to meet to meet already tight budgets, especially with power rates going up, and uh, and that's going to affect ancillary and auxiliary fees. And so I I do think that the I, I think the department has done has done some positive things in terms of providing supports with the with some affordability measures. I think we can do better, to be honest, and if we if we think outside the box a little bit. But I, I just I just think it's important to to emphasize again how that cutting to the core funding will just add significant cost pressures on institutions that then will be felt by students and their parents. And that will also affect uh, the quality of education that we're, we're giving in the province. And so at a time when we want to be thought leaders in the country, where we want to be a, the capital uh, for, for post-secondary education in the country with so many great ins institutions, eliminating uh, in very vital funding to those institutions, I think, um, negatively impacts our ability to, to reach those, those goals, to have a quality education system that our centers innovation and to make sure our post-secondary systems are at an affordable uh, 
the tuition levels are at afford an affordable rate. Um, quickly, I don't know how much time we need on this subject, but uh, NASCAD has been a topic of conversation that's been that's come up quite a bit in, in question period. And I know the Minister of Transportation and the member for uh, Upper Sackville Hammonds Plains Day, um, when I mentioned that the, uh, the department might be uh, not as supportive to NASCAD as it should be, said that they were. So my, my question is just, is, is the department supporting a, an independent NASCAD model and providing them the appropriate amount of, uh, of funding so that they can exist in that, that independent state as they have for, uh, for all the years that they've been in existence? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly this government is supporting uh, NASCAD as an independent institution. And um, I just want to remind the, uh, the honorable uh, member that um, the province actually contributes um, over 62% of NASCAD's operating budget, whereas some of the other uh, universities get as low as 30% and they make up the difference with uh, you know, their own fundraising tuition and, and whatnot. Um, and when you look at, at NASCAD uh, compared to other arts uh, colleges um, and universities or across, the, uh, across Canada, uh, NASCAD receives more funding per student than any other art school in Canada. So over the, and over the last uh, three years, we've um, put in six million additional dollars to NASCAD in order to, uh, to allow them to meet their, uh, their budget that that is unsustainable. And um, we are asking NASCAD and all universities, just as we are asking every government department and every other publicly funded body in this province, um, you know, Nova Scotians can't afford to fund um, how things are structured and how, how services are delivered the way they used to. We, we don't have blank checks in this, uh, in this province. And so we're asking everyone to to, uh, to evaluate and review how they do their work in order to allocate as much money as possible on the frontline services and on, on programming uh, for, for students. So this, pro this uh, government has been very, very supportive of NASCAD. Uh, it's actually celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. And, um, you know, I think there's, there's huge interest, motivation, and commitment to, uh, to, you know, provide another 125 years for NASCAD. But things have to be done differently. And I'm very, very pleased that the senior officials, uh, you know, other stakeholder groups, students, faculty, support staff, and the Board of Governors um, seem to be working together to recognize that they have to change the way they do things in order to maintain uh, quality programming and, and their international reputation. So, uh, if anything, this government has been more supportive than, than previous governments, but it has been recognized that their, their um, premature move to the Port Campus uh, created a structural deficit for them, and uh, they've been trying to make up lost, uh, lost revenue ever since. And um, so we're all working together to safeguard that institution. We value um, you know, fine arts education in this province. NASCAD is uh, an institution that we're extremely proud of. And I'm really, really pleased that uh, everyone now is, seems to be working together to move it into um, the next uh, phase of its, uh, its operation. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth with half a minute. Oh, wow. Um, uh, one of the, uh, the main issues I think that NASCAD has faced is the current funding formula um, doesn't necessarily reflect the actual cost of delivering some of the programs that they deliver. And I know that's a problem at other institutions as well. So I guess quickly, if we can, is there any plans in place? I know there was when we spoke earlier in the summer to actually review the current funding formula that's used to, to, to fund our post-secondary institutions. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Madam Chair. NASCAD actually benefits from a very generous uh, funding formula. That's not the issue here. Thank you. The time has allotted for the official opposition has elapsed. We are approaching the uh, hour of, uh, or the moment of interruption, so I'm going to suggest that we proceed to that. Take a brief break to set that up. The committee will now rise and report its progress to the House.
I'm going to suggest as well that staff would get their uh, welcome to leave their uh, supplies there and then we can you can pick it up when you come back in. Thank you. The committee of the chair of the committee of the whole house on supply reports. Now he reports. The uh, committee of the whole house on supply has met, has made some progress, and begs leave to sit again. Thank you. We have about reached the moment of interruption, and we will now do proceed with late debate. Under motion, the motion is under Rule 5.5. Late debate topic is therefore, be it resolved, that the Minister of Education immediately recognize the $65 million in education cuts undertaken by her government over the past two years is more than a family disagreement, and that families from Niels Harbor through to Tuscott will make a permanent decision on her government's future in the next election. This uh, resolution was submitted by the Honourable Member for Hans West, and I would recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton North. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to rise this evening to speak to this uh, resolution that the Minister of Education immediately recognized $65 million in education cuts undertaken by her government over the past two years is more than a family disagreement, and that families from Niels Harbor through Tuscott will make a permanent decision on her government's future in the next election. Uh, Mr. Madam Speaker, over the last year, um, we've seen 128 teacher cuts and 425 maintenance, consultant, and support staff cuts. While the government has increased their, their full-time equivalents by 553 people. And Madam Speaker, these over 500 people who have been cut have spouses, family members, and children who are of voting age. And when these people lose their job, it usually shows up in the following election especially if they're not able to find other positions anywhere else. Now this year we're hearing of cuts again. This time TAs, library, IT staff, property, transportation, and office staff. And if we add them all up again, and their families and spouses, we're talking a large number of people. Not only that, we have adult schools that are being affected by the cuts to the education system. And they're all voting age. Now, Madam Speaker, as we've seen here today, there was a number of